This is Senior Pastor Larry McCord, pastor of New Birth Christian Ministries Incorporated, located on Long Island, New York, reaching out to you wherever you may hear the sound of my voice, sending out the Word of God. I know many of you are troubled today, but you don't need to be afraid because you're God's property. And he said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. This is taken from Isaiah 54, verse 17. The only thing you can rely on is the word of God. Tune in and listen to New Birth Christian Ministries on YouTube channel. I look forward to seeing you. Greetings in the name of Jesus. Today is Black History Day, and we have some good stuff for Black History. Actually, it's Black History One, and we'll have speakers each week. If you would like to do something for Black History Month, let me know in advance. Today, we are going to have uh, Sister Karen. A deaconess Karen, rather, and she will be doing Shirley Chisholm's bio, and I will be following up with a bio on Reverend Ashton. So, deaconess Karen, take it away. Thank you, Sister Sandy. Shirley Chris Chrislum, fighter for human rights. Congresswoman Shirley Anita St. Hill Chrislum was the first African-American woman elected to Congress. Chrisman was a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus and the first African-American to make a serious bid for the presidency of the United States. She was born in New York City on November 30th, 1924. She grew up in Barbados and in Brooklyn, New York. Chrislam worked as a teacher while earning her master's degree in elementary education. Prior to her, to her 1968 election to Congress, Chrislam was an education consultant, consultant and former member of the New York State Assembly. She won the congressional race against the odds of both her race and sex and went on to make a name for herself as a fighter for human rights and dignity. She, saved the United, she served the United States House of Representatives for seven terms from 1968 to 1983. Crystal made history by nationally campaigning for the Democratic Party nomination for president the first black woman to seek the nation's highest office. As a member of the Congress, Crispin was an effective advocate for the needs of minorities, women, and children. She served on the, edu on the Education and the Workforce Committee, Committee on Rules, and Committee on Veterans. Crispin co-founded co the National Political Congress of Black Women, supported the Equal Rights Amendment, the National Organization of Women, and Congressional Black Caucus. She retired from Congress in 1983 to teach politics and women's studies at Mount Holyoke College and continued to advocate for education. Representative Shirley Chrislam died on January 1, 1st, 2005. Here are five quotes attributed to Representative Shirley Chrislam. You don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas too. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Three. You must reject not only the stereotypes that others have for us, but also those that we have for, of ourselves. I want history to remember me, not as the first black woman to have made a bid for the presidency of the United States, but as a black woman who lived in the 20th century and who dared to be herself, 
I want to be remembered as a catalyst for change in America. One, of course, laws will not eliminate prejudice from the hearts of human beings. But that is no reason to allow prejudice to continue to be enshrined in our laws to perpetuate injustice through inaction. I want to comment on that because I first heard about Shirley Chisholm when I was in public school. She was the only black woman that anyone talked about. This was way back in the dark ages of the 70s, right? The early 70s, like 70, 70, 71, 72. And Shirley Chisholm was out front. My family used to go to all the democratic conventions and we belonged to the democratic club at the time. And my neighbor across the street was the head of all the democratic clubs. And Shirley Chisholm would show up and Amen. as a little girl, I have to tell you, I was so impressed that this black woman would stand there and take on all the men and mostly yes, white men at the time. I can tell you, I was impressed at that age and she wasn't a light skinned black woman. She was our chocolate, chocolate sister. Skinny and, and mighty. Afraid yep. And because she was not afraid, I Amen. knew I didn't need to be afraid because it can be done. And that number two that I'm looking at, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Well, I have folded out my chair many a times with Sister Shirley in mine. So mm -hmm. I thank you, Sister Shirley Chisholm, for just being you and being the first the first of many if you were here i would interview you on my my podcast the first because you really represent it so thank you for that yes i had the pleasure too also sandy in my youth of meeting that woman especially whenever they had um the labor day on easter parkway she would come yes. out yes. she would come out to the community every time every time that's one thing see. I miss. I miss those people that, that stayed with the community and you got a chance as a little kid to meet them and see them and hear them, not by uh, social media, but live. That's the one thing we, the youth miss today. I, I can honestly say, if your doorbell rang, you did not know who was showing up. And a lot of time it was Sister Shirley Chisholm. She had no yes, problem yeah. ringing your doorbell and asking for something to eat. But you got good up in there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, she really, really impressed me. She was out there. Uh, as, a, as a black woman. So thank Amen. you. Amen. Thank you. And the next person I want to talk about today is Reverend Al Sharpton. You know, Reverend Al was not always my favorite. But I got to give props where props is due because he has been steadfast in this fight. I only have the first page here, but I'm going to read about Reverend Hal so you see where he's coming from. And the next he time when you with see age. him, you will you'll understand that yes. this is someone who is really dedicated his life to Black people and the black yes, culture indeed. and he's never he never deviated age. from that so reverend al sharp founder and president of the national action network reverend al sharpton is an internationally renowned civil rights leader founder and president of the national action network which has more than 100 chapters across the country Hailed by former President Barack Obama as a champion for the downtrodden, Reverend Sharpton is the host of Politics Nation on MSNBC, a nationally syndicated daily radio show, Keeping It Real, and a national broadcast radio show on Sundays titled The Hour of Power 
research at MIT in the fall of 2020. I listen to him every morning, when we, every Sunday when we drive in here because he is always on point and has people that you want to know about uh, on his show. So let me continue about his background. A disciple of the teachings of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Sharpton has been at the forefront of the modern civil rights movement for nearly half of a century. He has championed police reform and accountability, calling for the elimination of unjust policies like stop and frisk. He has fought for voting rights, equity in education and healthcare, and LGBTQ rights. Across the years, Reverend Sharpton has advocated for those who have been victimized, including Yusef Hawkins, Michael Stewart, Amadou Diallo, Abna Louima, Sean Bell, The Genesis Six, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, not this Michael Brown that's on our uh, phone today, Eric Garner, and others. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Reverend Sharpton preached his first sermon at the age of four at the historic Washington Temple Church of God in Christ. He was ordained at the age of 10. And by 13, he had been appointed youth director of New York's Operation Breadbasket, which is the economic arm of Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which we call the SCLC at 13. Under the tutelage of his mentors, the Reverends Jesse L. Jackson Sr. and William Augustus Jones Jr., Reverend Sharpton honed his organizing and protest skills around economic and political boycotts and quickly emerged as a national figure. By the time he turned 16, Reverend Sharpton had founded the National Youth Movement, which organized young people around the country to push for increased voter registration, cultural awareness, and job training program. A fierce believer in the philosophy of nonviolence, direct action protest, Reverend Sharpton founded National Action Network in 1991 and headquartered the organization in Harlem, all the while serving from 1993 to 1998 as director of the minister's division for Reverend Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition. An astute political strategist, Reverend Sharpton's analysis and his endorsement is frequently sought by political candidates seeking public office. Reverend Sharpton's foray into electoral politics resulted in historic and groundbreaking runs for the US Senate in 1992 and 1994, and he nearly forced a runoff in the Democratic primary for mayor of New York City in 1997. His noteworthy presidential run in 2004 brought thousands of new voters into the electoral process and repositioned himself as a trusted progressive who centered critical issues like a living wage, gun reform, and voting rights as a cornerstone of his campaign. In July 2004, at the request of the Democratic nominee, John F. Kerry, Reverend Sharpton delivered a rousing primetime speech at the Democratic National Co Convention in Boston. The author of three books, Reverend Sharpton is a frequent lecturer on civil rights and political issues and has lent his expertise to several corporate diversity councils at Pepsi, Walmart, and Charter Communications. He has received numerous awards, including the Harold Washington Award for the Congressional Black Caucus. He was also honored with the Mandela Legacy Hope Success and Empowerment Award in recognition for his long history of achievements in advancing civil rights causes around the world. In 2017, he received the prestigious James Joyce Award from the Literary and Historical Society 
of the University College in Dublin, Ireland. There's a lot more about uh, Reverend Sharpton, but I have to say, when we hear about him, we see him in one way, but you know, he's dedicated his whole life to, uh, to the, the politics and making sure black people are treated properly. So if anything, we've got to give him, uh, give him props for that. And I want to honor you today, Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you. And with that, we uh, want to move right into the prayer for the sick and shut in. I'm sorry I was so long, but you can, Karen, we can move right into the prayer for the sick and shut in. Thank you, Sister Sandy. Father God, we lift up all those who are facing illnesses today. We ask that you would bring healing, comfort, and peace to their bodies. Calm their fears and let them experience the healing power of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Father Lord, we ask you that you, you know what each and every one of us is in need of. We ask you to heal those who are getting over the coronavirus and it's flu season for those who are getting over the flu. We ask you those, we ask you to heal those who have mental problems, especially with being shut in for so long. Some people become very depressed and we ask you to lift them up and heal them and let them know that you are there whenever any time they need someone to talk to we ask you lord for healing for my mom her left eye she got something in her left eye and she's and um she's it's healing now thank you dear lord and i ask you to lift up my grandson who has uh cutting four teeth molars and has an air infection on top of it so we ask that he gets through this it's part of the growing process and we know we they don't like it we ask you dear lord to bless uh sister sandy deaconess thea minister sonia pastor larry sister donna and their families and all those who are listening this evening we ask you to lift them up. You know what we face in the coming week and we ask for strength and that we keep our minds focused on you as we get through our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Deaconess Karen. You're welcome. It's now time for the responsive reading. And it's taken from Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turns his ear to me, I will I call, call on him as long as I live. live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, Lord, save me. For you, O oh Lord, have delivered my, my soul, soul from, from death, death my, my, eyes ears, from tears, my eyes from my tears, feet from my feet from stumbling, that I may, that walk, I may before walk before the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. Amen, amen. It is now my distinct honor to introduce the speaker. We all know him as Pastor Larry, but he is the Reverend Dr. Larry McCord, our senior pastor. I am looking so forward to this sermon, this message that's being delivered from God at this moment. Because Pastor Larry has a way 
of delivering the word. So even the, the least of us, when I say the least of us, I mean children who are new to the faith will know and have a complete understanding of what he is saying, the message that he's delivering. So pay attention. It's going to be a, a, a decent ride or a good ride. And I'm looking forward to taking that ride with Pastor Larry. Amen. Praise the Lord for truly he's worthy to be praised. Before I bring the word today, I'm going to ask you to just uh, pray with me for a second. Father God, uh, we come to do your business today. But Lord, we want to do your business in such a way that those people that think they heard the story will see the story in a different light. Because Lord, you if you wanted it told the same old, same old, you wouldn't have sent me. God, you said, speak the truth. Let the people understand, Lord, that time out for foolishness. We know, Lord, that you've given us chance after chance after chance. But some of us just won't get it right. Lord, we're asking you, Lord, to open our eyes and open our ears and let us receive the blessings that you have for. Lord, because you haven't struck us down when we went off the road and uh, into the woods and uh, strayed from your straight path. We got the feeling that you wouldn't do it. But Lord, I've been watching the news and more than a half a million people have fallen victim to the COVID. So Lord, those of us who are paying attention understand that time is getting near. Each and every one of us will see you one day and we have to give an account for ourselves. So Lord, we ask that we can tell this message, Lord, so that somebody might understand that you're not interested in whether they drive a Benz or a Lexus, that you're not interested in whether or not they got 800 credit score, but you're interested in their humanity. All these things we thank you for. Amen. I don't intend to be before you long. The title of my sermon today is It Must Be Love. I'm going to talk to you today about how the Christianity, and in the case of this story, the humanity of certain religions, how they fall as God would see. Them. Not as we would see, but as how God sees. I hope you brought your Bible. And if you're home, open your book up. I want you to look at Luke 10. When you find it, say amen. Luke 10, verse 25. We're going to read 25 to 37. While you're looking for that, you remember back in the day when Jesus the Christ came on the scene and he grew up and he was considered a teacher or a rabbi. And his views differed from the views of the ruling high priests and the consuls and the scribes and the Pharisees. Given the fact of who his father is, you kind of wonder why they would be different. So at, the, at that time, the Jewish consuls was laying a plot to embarrass Jesus. They wanted to prove he didn't know everything that he thought he knew. So they sent a certain lawyer, verse 25. They sent a certain lawyer who was an expert in the Mosaic law. I'm reading from the Amplified Version because it tells you what he was an expert in. He stood up to test Jesus and standing up was a sign of respect. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus looking at him being the son of God knew when somebody was coming disingenuous. And while he was asking Jesus a question, Jesus knew he was an authority. So Jesus asked him a question. He said, you can read it for yourself. What's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Notice how he put himself a little bit higher. He said, you correct. Do this habitually and you will live. Now I'm going to point something out to you because the scripture don't tell you this, but I want you to understand that you know there's not two commandments, correct? So did Jesus say to him, you only got to get two right? Think about it as a teacher. I teach a class. I gave 10 questions on the exam and you only get two right. You're bad. So Jesus told him, go ahead on and do this. You realize Jesus was using sarcasm. You're not as smart as you think you are. Because guess what? I didn't told you go do two commandments and you live. And if you buy that, I'll, let me say you the Brooklyn Bridge. You see, the scripture, when people read it, they don't read all the things they need to see 
because the scribe didn't have a word processor. He didn't type a hundred words a minute. And when he wrote something down, it was like a bullet point. Now somebody might say, ooh, how you know all of this? Don't worry about it. He got it covered. See, because on a certain day I told people, I said, you sure you want me to go? He said, yeah, I want you to go because you tell the truth. Move it, move it, move it up some because I can't see the, the rest of the scripture. Move up the scripture. But he was wishing and justified. Now, let me tell you what's going on here. This gentleman was kind of feeling kind of tricked because he realized he came to get Jesus. And before he came, they were together deciding how they were going to get Jesus. And one lawyer said to the other, now remember these experts in the Bible at that time, no New Testament. The lawyer said to the other, well, you go, but if you can't get him, I will get him. Meaning I'm going to trick him and trap him up. That's what they were doing. You may know this story as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's told by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Think about this. He asked Jesus something. And Jesus, rather than give him an answer, gave him a question. But in order to give him the question, he had to set the stage. And that stage was a parable. Jesus replied in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he encountered robbers who stripped him of his clothes and belongings. They probably took his wallet, his purse. They took his coat, and they took his pants. They left him virtually naked, they left him beat up beside the road and nearly dead. Now, in verse 31, by coincidence, a priest was going down the road when he saw the man laying on the other side of the road. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, oh, I'm sorry, like verse 32, likewise a Levite also came down to the place and saw him and passed on the other side of the road. And in verse 33, but a Samaritan who is a, for a foreigner who was traveling came upon the man. And when he saw him, he was deeply moved with compassion for him. And he went to him and bandaged up his wound, pouring oil and wine on them to soothe and disinfect the injuries of the man. He put him on his own horse and brought him to an end and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, which is two days of wages, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of this man. And if you have to spend some more on my way back, I will repay you when I return. Which of these three do you think proved himself a neighbor to the man who encountered the rock? Notice what he did. You come to question me, but who am I? The son of God. You come to me and you're an authority on the book. So what do I do? Ask you a question that's not in the book. Did you follow me? You see, you think because you read the Bible one time, you understood the Bible. Then that means you must be going to heaven. I hope you're tithing, because if you didn't get it right, you ain't being obedient. You remember the scripture, if you love me, you will obey my command. Well, if you're missing commandments, what does that mean? You didn't understand what you read, or you're just disobedient. Neither one going to get you in. Like he said, he sent me because I'm going to tell you the truth. Oh, I preaching to be popular with you. I got the answer for what I do to him. You see, a lot of ministers out there will tell you what you want to hear. Oh, but on judgment day, <laughs> there's only one thing he looking for. Did you tell my word? And his word said, he asked the man who showed himself, who showed compassion and mercy to the trap. Let me preach to you if I can. Show me the, show me the slide. Uh, where the gentleman is helping the Samaritan. I should say the Samaritan is helping him. Leave that up for a minute. Now, we know three people came by. The priest came by. This was an ordained person, somebody with some rank, some elevation. Why didn't he stop to help the man? Let's look at this for a minute. Let's think about this. Well, number one, he could have been on his way to an important church meeting, and maybe he was sharing to me. Maybe he was the keynote speaker. He might have not had no time, had to be on time, couldn't keep, leave all them people waiting, all them important folks. He had to, you know, I'm, he could, you know look, we're trying to help him out, you know. Secondly, he may have believed that the robbers was laying, laying over there waiting for him to stop. 
Because if you stop, <laughs> oh, I'm going to get you now. I'm going to get your purse. He could have been scared that he might be robbed and mugged and beaten. So that could have been a good reason. Let's come on to the Levite, the second verse. Now, the Levite wasn't an ordained officer. He might have been a deacon. Could have been a Sunday school teacher. Maybe he was the head usher, but he was religious. He knew the rules and the regulations. And at least he stopped to see if the man really was hurt or faking. But then he crossed over side the road on the other side and went about a minute. Now comes the third man, the man we see on the screen. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Jews and Samaritans couldn't stand one another. They despised each other. But in this case, the Samaritan helped the Jew. Now you realize that the priest was you. In case you don't know, now you know. So was the Levite. They didn't stop to help their brother. Oh, I'm looking at my watch. I got, I got to go to me. Oh, wait a minute. Might be another rabble over here going to mug me. Don't pay me enough to, to pay me over. I ain't first date. How come the Samaritan stopped what he was doing, knowing the man wasn't a Samaritan, and helped him? Let's look at this. First, he stops to run the first aid. He gets off his horse, gives the man something to drink, bandages his wounds, pours oil on his wounds, and then he pours wine. Now, somebody might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you pour the wine on the wound? Isn't the wine for you to drink? You see, wine is symbolic of blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how did the priest just pass by and do nothing? What's on the outside or what's on the inside? So he didn't have the love of God, did he? What did the, what did the lawyer ask them? How do I get into hell? Love God with all your heart and soul. Woo! And love your neighbor. That's just said. What did he do? <laughs> I can't stop. I got somewhere to go. Just imagine if that was you or I laying on the road and needing help. Wouldn't have got it that day, would he? So-called man of God. Now ask yourself a question. Imagine you're new to the neighborhood and you, you brought your children from wherever you came from because you, you was being abused. And you get here and it's the weekend. Social service is not open. You say, I ain't got no food to feed my children and I don't know nobody. Oh, there's a church over there. Let me go there and see if I can get something. And the head deacon goes and talks to the missionary lady and they say, oh, let me look in the offering box and see if there's something we got in there to help this woman. She got three children with us. We can't give her five dollars. We got to give her enough to last all Saturday and Sunday until she can go to social services on Monday. Jesus. Then we call somebody in the congregation and say, can you put her up in your spare room? And they go, who? Oh, I don't know them people. Is that a Christian? Is that a Christian move? I don't know them people. They might wreck me. Uh, can you give us some money so we can help the lady out? We're going to take up a collection. She got a number. You start to see how the real deal matches something that was written 2,000 years ago? But let me tell you that there's a, a Aretha Franklin or somebody singing in Madison Square Garden is $50. Oh, I want to go, Pastor. 
I got my, I'm going to go to the ATM and get the money. What does God say? The greatest commandment is to love him. And doesn't he say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments? Shouldn't we be able to look in the treasury and find money to give the woman? But how will there be money in the treasury if you didn't do what you're supposed to do? Did you notice the Samaritan who's not a Christian or a Jew? Didn't I think it robbery to give two days wages after he gave the man what he had? He gave money for the man to be taken care of. Who is the true believer? The high priest? The deacon? The Sunday school teacher? <laughs> Oh, now somebody said, wait a minute. You said the title of the sermon is it must be love. You ever heard somebody tell you they love you? And then you catch them doing your dirty? What we call that, air promise? As soon as they leave you, as soon as the words leave their mouth, it vanishes in thin air, doesn't it? Is it what you say or what you do? Look at what he's doing. To take that screen down. We've embarrassed enough so called Christians already because it's not what you say, it's what you do. Let's see. What does this story symbolize? What should you have gotten from it? The message that Christ wants us to have from this is that the poor and the outcasts are blessed. That man was blessed. But he wasn't blessed by no priest, and he wasn't blessed by no deacon, and he wasn't blessed by no Sunday school teacher. He was blessed by a total stranger who was a different faith. Now, let me give you a better example. Do you remember the time when Jesus healed the blind man right outside the synagogue? Put some mud on his eyes and told him, go watch. The priest heard about that. And they called the guy's parents to come. Was he really blind? Yeah, he was. How long have you been blind? Since birth. Now y'all lying. Lying for what? Why did they attack Jesus for helping somebody? You notice how it's working? Righteous people. If you're righteous, why are you jealous of somebody doing something you can't do or won't do? Amen. Y'all ain't never thought about this. With all the churches in Union Day, what would God send us here? By the way, what my idea? It was his idea. He told me exactly where I was supposed to go. Took me seven years to finally make it back over here. Because I can't get there until he opened the door. Somebody might say, well, wait a minute. What you trying to do? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that the priest knew all the laws and the rules? The priest, the ordained guy. So whatever happened to them commandments that says, love your neighbor as yourself? He didn't forget that one that day, right? That meeting was important, wasn't it? Watch this. Imagine if he was laid over there on the side of the road that he had got mugged. Would he feel the same way about a stranger passing him? Talk about him like a dog if he make it back, right? Exactly. Oh, he didn't even stop to help me. He knew I was his pastor. He knew I had a church over there. He knew I was a man of God. And he didn't stop to help me. And it had nothing to do with your station in life. It had to do with God's humanity for man. Notice, the man that got help was a Jew. Passed him by. Jew. Ordained clergy. Ah. 
Why? It wasn't convenient. I'll help you if I'm not busy and I ain't doing nothing. Where in the Bible does it teach that? Because I ain't seen it. Show me. Number two, how is the Good Samaritan relevant today? Remember, this story is 2,000 years old. Are we not called to help people in need? You know what I'm saying? People get it twisted. If you help your sister, you think God going to give you blinded points for them? You help your mama. You help your child. Do you really think that that's going to get you grounded? Or is that something you're supposed to do? The Samaritan story told by Jesus about a stranger. Because you're supposed to help whoever you, you come upon who is in need. Watch this. The man asked Jesus, the lawyer, well, who is your neighbor? <laughs> Think about it. He's pretty smart, but he don't know who his neighbor is. What does this story say about the man he didn't know? Because Samaritan didn't know that man. What does it say? What does it tell us? Did he know that man? No. No. Never seen him before. Did he live in the same community as that man? He's a Samaritan. I don't think so. It's not. So, they can better stand each other. How is it somebody who was not of the predominant faith at that time, Abraham see not doing God's work. Same thing that's happening now. Watch something. You know the Statue of Liberty, right? It's in the harbor, right? It said, give me your tired, your poor, your disenfranchised. And I'm gonna embrace them and let them in. What don't they? What don't you see in the fine print? If they're what? If they're what? White. Because if you go to the border a couple of years ago, do I have a picture of how they treated the Haitians when they came in and the other migrant workers? Can you put that on the screen, please? My border patrol was dealing with people. The person looks like the one that was by the side of the road on the ground. Look at who's riding next to him. Some of us call them ICE. Some of us call them border patrol. And some of them call you, oh, there's a there's a graphic. US border agents chase migrants on horseback. You think they got the memo? You think they went to church and was told, love thy neighbor? Does it look like love is going on? Well, maybe you confused. Did you see the CNN news and the Fox News that said, uh, Migrants are coming, attacking American border. They're trying to break into America. I got a question for you. Did it say that when the Irish left Ireland doing the potato famine? Let them right in, didn't it? How about when the Italians came over? Did it say that then? Look at what it says right now. By the way, that ain't 2,000 years ago. That's probably two months ago. What do you see going on here? Those of us that call ourselves Christians or acting like us, can't say it. But we ain't acting like the, we understood the word of God, are we? Hello. My question is this. This man is an island. Do you think? If we fight ourselves in this country, 
that it'll be a lot easier for Putin to come after after the war, the civil war that they're about to have? Or do you think that nobody from January 6th is getting ready for round two? Why? What punishment did they really get for round one? And because some people are saying nothing happened, right? We just walked in, we had an invitation, we had a message of, 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 you know, they just let us in the door. That ain't what I seen. Don't believe your lying eyes. Do you really think that God is going to keep protecting us from our enemies when you look in the Bible, when the Jews got out of order, when the Israelites got out of order, did he not allow them to go captive by the Babylonians? The Babylonians capture the Jews when they all dispersed all over because they got out of order. Well, they're the favorite and chosen people, but they got out of order, didn't they? Let the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. If you love me, you will keep my command. The title of the sermon is it must be love. But that ain't love right there. Now, are we confused? You can take that scripture, that uh, slide down. The moral to the story of the Good Samaritan is you should put aside your differences and help those who are in need. The Samaritan did not think about the race or religion of the man he helped. He just saw somebody who was in need of help. If you don't stop to help a hungry man, what will happen to him? The priest in the parable may have believed, if I stop, what's going to happen to me? But what he should have said is, if I don't help him, what's going to happen to him? The Samaritan poured wine on his wound because wine has alcohol, which is a disinfectant. Oh, how come the man who don't even go to the synagogue knew that and not only that he didn't think it was a robbery to help somebody you see i'm a different kind of pastor i believe our job is to help those other children of god but not only help them have a word for them but don't let the word be all we be about because if you talk the talk you need to walk the walk Getting to heaven and eternal life. Do you love God with all your heart? Or just when Macy's don't have a say? Just when the inch of snow don't hit the ground? Because if snow hit the ground, I can't uh, <clears throat> I can't go to church today. When the churches need volunteers for something, do you sneak out the door? If you, by the way, if you want to be saved as easy as ABC, you have to acknowledge your sin. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And you have to confess your sin with your mouth. ABC, as the Jackson said, and one, two, three, love your neighbor. Second commandment. But first love God and obey his command. Back to you. Did I not tell you all that that would be an excellent ride? It was fabulous. And it was a great comparison to what was going on 2000 years ago to what's going on now, right now. If we don't know the history from whence we came, then we will be destined to repeat it. I don't know who said that, but it's quoted from somebody. And I'm not going to try to make something up. However, I have a news flash. Bob Saget passed away last month because he hit his head and he went to sleep. So what I'm trying to tell you all, I don't know, I know that everybody who is visibly on zoom is a member 
and are safe. However, I don't know if there's anybody in the backgrounds of people's homes. And I want to implore upon you that you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know if you're going to end up in the grave. I'm sure that those two police officers that went and answered a call had no idea that they would be dead within, I think one was dead with, right, right away and one died within a week. We don't know what God has planned for us. So it's important to know where you're going to spend your eternity. Some people don't care, but I can tell you that based on what it says in the Bible, I do not want to be gnashing my teeth for the long haul through eternity, being poked by the devil's spears, hot spears at that. We in the winter, in the summertime, we always say it's so hot. Imagine how hot it is in hell. So that's just a sobering image. And if there's anybody who is listening in the background who would like to be saved, let me know. Is there one? Is there two? Or are there two? Okay, so if there's anybody in the background who needs a church home, we would love to open our arms and have you come to this church located at 800 Jerusalem Avenue in Uniondale. We would love to welcome you with open arms to this ministry because as pastor said in the beginning of his message, he gives it, he gives the truth. He shoots straight from the hip. And we're a Bible believing, Bible ministering church. So if there's anybody who wants to join this church, feel free to email or if you want to speak up now. And I just want to say, I love you all very much. And this Black History Month, think about the people who you are passing by on the streets. Think about your brothers and sisters, whether they're dark, darker skinned, or speak another language. Think about the people that you're passing on the streets and lend a helping hand. Okay. On Listen. that note, I want to say tomorrow is a day that we celebrate love. And I want to thank Sister Sonia for being such a wonderful associate pastor and coming in and help us. And Sister Donna, can you come in for a minute? They get ro a roses and a chocolate. And Miss Thea, yours is here, but I'm gonna take it home. Thank you. This is Donna, thank you, Donna. Thank, thank you for thank helping you. us, thank helping you. us out. Thank you. Sister Sandy. Sure. Yes, Sandy. yes, Miss. Yes, Sister Thea. Thank you. I love you guys. And the first stranger that you meet, Sister Sandy, give it to that stranger and tell them it that God. I might not even them. get there. I might eat the chocolate okay. before. You okay. tell them that God loves them and, and or your mother. Okay. Tell her that I God. I will. Okay. I will. Thank you. You guys Thank stay blessed. So I love you guys. We love you. Okay. you. Love you too. And Sister Karen, same for you. I'll send you a virtual flower. Oh, that'll be fine. Thank you. <laughs> well, we love all you guys and we appreciate you, Brother Mike. Thanks we for coming out. You too. And hope you guys have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Too. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Larry, would you grace us with the benediction? I don't know about y'all, but I always feel good about giving God his day and putting him first. I've learned if I put him first, he'll never put me last. And somebody might say, well, how is that work? I said, I don't know, I'm not God, I'm only me. I'm responsible for my part. 
Because God ain't never not done his part in my life. It didn't matter what it looked like. I used to hear people say, we've been may do it for a night. But joy comes in the morning, and I'm telling you that joy Amen. has come in the morning. Father God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for another chance to worship you. And Lord, we use this opportunity, if we weren't right, to get right with you. Because Lord, we know that no man know the day or the hour. But we will close our eyes and wake up at the seat of judgment. I know I want to hear well done come on in but some people like the people that go to atlantic city and the people that place bets on the phone now they they like to gamble eternity is too long for me to try to shoot dice with my life i'm so glad you told me that you would be at the gate for me i hope others are in the same situation but if they're not we'd be happy to give them a tour of what it's like while we're absent one from another, Lord, I ask you to be a protection over each and every person over the sound of my voice. I ask you to put your arms of protection around them like you wrapped me, Lord, for all the years that you had me under your wing. No hurt, harm, or danger could take me out. When COVID came, not one relative of mine even got a scrape or a scratch. Lord, I'm asking you to hide the people on this call under your wing put your arms of protection around them until we meet again let us say amen and amen this is pastor larry mccord thank you for attending our services here at newburgh we appreciate your contribution and support please visit us here in person as well as on zoom May the blessings of the Lord go with you and go in peace.